We are talking today with Mike Hoffman. He is a former Lance Corporal in the Marine Corps, a veteran of the current war in Iraq, and co-founder of Iraq Veterans Against the War. Mike, mm -hmm. how is it that you ended up being in Iraq in the first place? Well, I joined the Marines back in February of 99. Um, not straight out of high school, kind of messed around for about a year and a half, working odd jobs, things like that. Just wasn't getting anywhere in my life. Uh, there were no real job opportunities. My father was a steel worker, and the steel was going bankrupt very quickly. Um, I wasn't much, I really wasn't college material because I was a horrible student, didn't have many options in that respect. So when a friend who was getting ready to graduate came up and said, hey, I'm joining the Marines, you should look into it. Um, I went, I said, all right, I'm not doing much, so I'll talk to the recruiter. And he made a great sales pitch because that's exactly what they are. Recruiters are salesmen. We have to remember that. So, and he, he made his sales pitch. He said, you know, we'll give you job training, money for education, uh, roof over your head, three square meals a day. And on top of all this, you get to see the world and defend your country. So I jumped at the chance. Uh, from there, I went to Paris Island, South Carolina for my, bas for my basic training boot camp, um, permanent duty station of... Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, spent a little bit of time in Japan and California. And in December of 2002, I was supposed to be going home. I was getting discharged. I served my four years honorably. And then two days before I was supposed to be going home for good, my first sergeant called me into his office and said, I'm sorry to tell you, this, tell you this, but as of this morning, the Secretary of the Navy has signed a stop loss order. You're not going home. You're going to Iraq with the rest of the unit. So instead of going home like I thought I was, in February of 2003, I was deployed to Kuwait with the rest of my unit, and then March 20th of 2003, I was crossing the border into Iraq. And what were your thoughts on our war with Iraq from the start? Well, from the very start, I was against the war. I just, I didn't believe the intelligence. I didn't believe what we were being told. In my unit, I was one of the few people actually trained in chemical defense. I actually knew what it would take to attack us with chemical weapons. And looking at what they were saying and what they were showing us, I realized there was no way they had that kind of, that they had that kind of weaponry that they were able to use. Even if they did have it, you know, even if it was really there buried somewhere, you can't use buried weapons. You know, it's kind of, you can't employ that. And it takes massive amounts of chemical weapons to attack an, an, a huge military unit like ours. So I just, I didn't believe any of that. But, you know, also the idea of preemptive war really disturbed me. Preemptive war, as everybody knows, is nonstop war. You know, what Orwell talked about in 1984, you know, constant war. Um, so, yeah, it was really, a, I, I disagree with that on those terms, but it was more academic. You know, it was looking at it and saying, well, you know, I don't believe in this, you know, things like that. After being there, it went from being academic to being personal. You know, I partook in the destruction of a foreign country. You know, I was part of that because of, my actions and my unit's actions, not just Iraqi military, but innocent civilians lost their lives. And that's something I deal with now, and that's what really drives what I'm doing. And how long after you were there did that start to sink in? It was really a strange process when I got home. Um, I, was dis I was discharged almost a year ago today. Um, I got home finally for good in early June of 2003. And uh, at first, I was just happy to be home, you know, really elated, you know, hanging out with friends, doing things like that. And uh, first, I was just going out with my friends and having a good time. And then I just started going out and drinking and drinking and drinking all the time. And, you know, from day one, when I got back, I wasn't happy with the war. I wasn't happy with what had gone on there. And looking back now and talking to my friends who are Vietnam vets and things like that, I realized what I was doing was something they call self-medication, which basically just numbing yourself with whatever's on hand. Luckily for me, it was alcohol. For a lot of the Vietnam vets, it was uh, it was heroin. Um, but yeah, I was I was honestly at, on the verge of becoming an alcoholic when I first came home, and you know, within a few about two months after I got back is when I had my first nightmare. A few months after that, I had my first flashback, and it was really disturbing. I I knew what it was because you know, for my generation, we all know about the crazy Vietnam vets and what they've gone through and what they've experienced. So I could see it in myself. I just didn't know what to do about it and things like that. And luckily, where I live now, it's um, an area called Bucks County outside of Philadelphia. And as I call it, it's, it's Quaker Central. 
um, back in the, in the uh, 18th century when the Quakers came to the U.S. And, and they came to Pennsylvania, they settled there. And uh, every little town has a meeting house. So when I started reaching out, the first people I found were Quakers. And from, you know, they've been doing this kind of work for, oh, who even knows how long. So when they saw me, they knew who I was and they knew what I was going through. And they get, had a lot of kind words and kind of pointed me in the right direction. And the direction they pointed me in was Veterans for Peace. And to this day, I say, you know, Veterans for Peace and the guys in the Philadelphia chapter probably saved my life. You know, they, they pulled me out. They, they listened. They listened. It's not just a lot of people listen. You know, it, it's easy to listen to a veteran, but it's hard to understand. And really the only people who truly understand are other veterans, you know, guys who have been through that. And that's what they did for me. And it wasn't just that they listened and understood, but they also gave me a tool to fight with. You know, for the first time, I was in a situation with an organization that knew the struggle I was I was in for, and they were fighting it themselves and saying, you know, hey, you know, we're with you on this. And I immediately started speaking with veter- speaking out as a member of Veterans for Peace after that. Do you think your situation is unique in terms of people who served over in Iraq, questioning the war, and then needing to do something to find that tool? Um, no, it's not unique. And the problem is, is that I feel there's a lot of other people out there who feel the same way with me, but they haven't been lucky enough to be steered in the direction I'm in right now. Um, when I look at where how I got here, it was an, just really an incredible set of circumstances that I ended up here, that I got involved with the Quakers in Pennsylvania. It was actually through a uh, community ad talking about a form they were putting on. And that's how I found it. I was just browsing through the local paper one day, and I, I stumbled on it. Just an incredible set of circumstances, and I was very lucky. And the thing is that um, groups like this, um, like Iraq Veterans Against the War, Veterans for Peace, um, even Quaker organizations, things like that, are very marginalized by the mainstream media. So unless you're really looking, you don't find out about groups like this. You don't hear about things, you know, about the forums put on and things like that. So Iraq veterans coming home, unless they're lucky enough to, to have family members hooked up with military families speak out or something like that, they don't hear about this. So they're just left fumbling around in the darkness trying to find some kind of outlet. I mean, right now, um, IVAW, Iraq Veterans Against the War, we started out with eight members back in July of, of uh, last year. We're almost a year old now. We have over 200 members now. It may not sound like a lot, but for me, I consider that a great success. You know, considering we've had very little mainstream attention, very little overall influence in the mainstream. I mean, we're very influ- influential within the anti-war movement, but, but outside of that, we're almost an unknown. So what was the motivation in founding your group, Iraq Veterans Against the War, since groups like Veterans for Peace already existed? Right. Well, it's actually, it was Veterans for Peace, those guys from Veterans for Peace and Vietnam Veterans Against the War that pushed us towards starting this organization. Um, And they realize it's not so much about separating ourselves from their organization. It's more about giving our own voice, having some kind of ownership of our own organization, which is a really important thing. It's really important for guys coming home not to feel like we're we're speaking for somebody else, that we're speaking on our own, that this is our group, our organization. That's what it really is. Um, But on the other hand, you know, we're also trying to build up Veterans for Peace. I, I would love, you know, down the line that when this war is over and finally behind us, but we'll never forget about it, that IVAW just kind of, you know, fades into the background a little bit and all the IVAW members go on as members of Veterans for Peace. This isn't just about this war. You know, I view the war in Iraq as a symptom of the overall problems that we're dealing with. Granted, it's the most horrible thing and we need to stop it, but there's a lot of struggle to go on beyond this. So what do you see as the primary goals of IVAW? First and foremost, it's it's ending the occupation. And when I say end the occupation, I mean all foreign troops out of Iraq. This isn't just American troops. This isn't just British troops. This isn't bringing, you know, the current occupation forces out and letting France take over since they weren't part of the initial invasion. With all that of Iraq's gone through since, you know, Saddam Hussein came to power, the first Gulf War, the Iran-Iraq War, this current war, the sanctions... Any foreigner, any foreign person with a rifle in Iraq will be viewed as an occupier, no matter if they wear a U.S. Army helmet or a U.N. helmet. They're still occupying troops, and they're going to be viewed the same way. 
They're going to meet the same kind of resistance and violence. You know, there's, there's no good solution in Iraq. We've screwed things up so horribly that there's no good way out. So really, we just need to get out. And the sooner we do this, the better it will be. You know, the, the longer we stick around, the bigger the problems will be when we do finally pull out. And then once we do accomplish that, we don't just abandon Iraq. You know, the anti-war movement, the real anti-war movement calling for withdrawal of troops is often accused of abandoning the people of Iraq. I will never abandon the people of Iraq. I realize what we've done to them. I was part of it. I was part of the destruction of that country. I will never abandon them. You know, when things come down and the option is there, I plan on returning to Iraq to do what I can to help out, just like the Vietnam veterans have. They've come back. I think it's a really important step for all Iraq War veterans to do something like that. There's hundreds of Vietnam veterans who've done exactly that. So this is about giving them real help, real aid, not through Halliburton, not through Bechtel, not through Kellogg, Brown, and Root. This is the Iraqis when they pick themselves up and say, okay, we need to fix things. And they say, okay, we've got this water plant outside of this city. It's been, you know, horribly, just horribly damaged. We need these supplies and this much money to, re to rebuild it. We give them that. That's what we owe to those people for what we've done. And then finally, you know, the other victims of this is, you know, people talk about the victims being Iraqis. Well, in many respects, those in the U.S. Military are, military are victims of this war as well. We didn't sign up to fight a war like this. We signed up to protect and serve our country. This has nothing to do with that. This is not protecting our country. This was a war for oil and profit. This was not a war about our nation's defense. So we're victims in this as well. And I... For, and to that extent, you know, we signed up, we were promised certain things. We were promised money for education, we were promised health benefits, you know, all these things, and they're not delivering. You know, the GI benefit, as good as it is in certain respects, is horribly underfunded. You know, we need a full reinstatement of veterans' benefits, and I think it goes beyond that because what I view as veterans' benefits aren't just veterans' benefits. I view them as basic human rights, the right to health care, the right to an education, these aren't things that you should have to join the military to be guaranteed. These are things that every single person in this world should be guaranteed. You were talking, I believe, about uh, symptoms. This, mm -hmm. this is symptoms of a greater problem. Can right. you talk about that? Right. Um, you know, when I look at what's going on, it's really just uh, I mean, the greater problem. If, if you look at the U.S. right now, um, academically, there's something, I think it's 14, 14 um, points that make up a fascist government. It's, it's a very scary thing, and when you look at that, if you look at it in a very open-minded fashion, the U.S. has hit every single one of those points. You know, not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not saying we are living in a fascist government. I'm not going to say that because, you know, some points we've hit very strongly. Some point, yeah, we're, we're doing it, but it's not, you know, they haven't been effective or they haven't, you know, really accomplished it, but they're trying tooth and nail to do it. Um, you know, I see our country going in a very dangerous place. I see a lot of very dangerous things going on right now. Um, peak oil is one of them. You know, this is that's one thing driving this is the fact that the U.S. is about to be eclipsed as the leading consumer of petroleum products. India and China are shooting up there in the use of petroleum. This is going to create a very bad situation where there's going to be major. Um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's going to be a, a lot of fighting over who's going to be getting the oil and who's going to be paying how much for it. And I think that's one of the major reasons for what's going on in Iraq. You know, there's and also the fact that there's not going to be the oil. And it's something we're not talking about. Um, Bush claims he's addressing it right now through some of his environmental things. He's uh, His answer is to create more nuclear power plants and to drill for oil in Alaska. Those are stopgap measures. They're not going to solve the problem. There are other solutions. There's, you know, putting more research into biomass fuels, um, pushing Detroit to actually go full bore on hybrid cars. You know, imagine if we actually put, put real research money into biomass fuels and put out affordable hybrid cars in mass production. Right there would solve our energy crisis, but nobody's looking at it because it's not affordable. We need to step beyond the, the profit margin and look at humanity overall. You know, because the current market system we're in, it's self-destructive. It's destroying itself right now as we speak. You know, um, Kyoto hasn't been signed. I mean, Kyoto wasn't a perfect piece of uh, legislation, but it's better than what we're dealing with right now. 
there's so many pieces of this puzzle environmentally um, with human rights all these they need to play together we have to all we have to realize they're all part of the exact same issue what's your response to people that say groups like yours and what you're talking about is demoralizing to troops in Iraq well this is what I say and you can talk to any combat vet and they'll agree with me when you're over there and you're getting shot at you're not thinking about how many people are talking about the war you're not thinking about how many people are protesting you're not thinking about the amount of yellow ribbons stuck on people's cars all you're thinking about is getting you and your buddy home alive they're not thinking about this stuff and that's my answer and when you were talking earlier about the 14 points of fascism right. that the U.S. has touched upon, mm -hmm. I think some people would say that's, again, combined with what your group is doing, that that's treasonous. <laughs> it is, and that's actually, um, you know, I'm trying to remember, um, Hitler's propaganda master, I always get all Goebbels. their... Goebbels. Went on record saying it's easy to get the people to go along with them. You know, you put out the things, and whoever does not uh, does dissents you label as as treasonous and you label them as unpatriotic and that's and that's exactly what they're doing right now it's scary you know the idea of supporting the troops according to the bush administration and their propaganda machine is now one and the same with supporting the administration it's i mean when you displace yourself from the political ideology you know of the left and the right and things and just look at them purely as a media machine They've done an incredible job. They're good at this. It's scary that they're so good. I mean, I, I, I hate what Karl Rove, what he stands for and things, but you have to admire him in a PR sense that they can spin things, but it's starting to collapse on him. Um, this thing with Newsweek is a perfect example. You have some somebody like, uh, um, oh, I'm so horrible with names, um, Keith uh, Oberman from uh, does the, the evening news for MSNBC call for the resignation of Bush's press secretary. It's starting to collapse on him. You can only spin things so far before, pe before you start double speaking on yourself. Um, he was called out in a press conference you know, about the Newsweek story saying this is what happens when you use you know, anonymous sources consistently like this. And a reporter there actually you know, then asked him, well, what about your own use of anonymous sources during press briefings? So it, it's starting to fall apart, but it's really, it's hard. They are so good at this spin thing, and it, it's something we have to fight against. But I think that's where IVAW, Veterans for Peace, VVAW falls into play. You know, they can attack anyone else's patriotism, but when they start attacking the patriotism of those who have served, of those who have fought, that gets a little bit harder. That really changes the playing field. If you look at when VVAW did the Dewey Canyon 3 um, event, that's when, you know, John Kerry threw his medals over the fence and the, the Winter Soldier um, testimony in the Senate, that's where all that came about. And they camped out on the White House lawn and they came up to Nixon and said, you know, the Supreme Court has ruled against them. You know, they said they cannot sleep in the White House front yard and they said, should we call the cops? And Nixon said no. You can't do that because <laughs> it's kind of funny. I, I look at VFP, you know, the only thing worse than being up a bunch of combat vets is being up a bunch of nuns. So it, it's something that we can use and it's something we're well aware of. So you don't see it as a contradiction that people can be both supportive of the troops and want to end the occupation at the same time? No, it's not a contradiction at all. I view it as one and the same. You know, um, I think I'm not you know, a, a warmonger, but I am definitely pro-military. I think because of the state of the world, we need to be able to defend ourselves if we are threatened. You know, if Canada invaded tomorrow, I'd be the first person at the border defending us. But this isn't the situation. You know, that's not what's going on right now. That's what the military needs to be used for. The military needs to be used for battles of self-defense when we have no other option but military force. That's what I signed up for. That's why I joined the military. And supporting the troops is demanding that they only be used in situations like that, that they only be asked to risk their lives when they have to. That's supporting the troops. Supporting the troops is not sending them into an unjust, immoral war based on lies. That is not, that is not support. And I think people need to understand that. I would assume that you have communications with people still serving in Iraq. Can you talk about what you see as currently happening there? 
it's starting to fall apart. I mean, it it's, was never together in the first place, but it's getting a lot worse. Um, just within the past couple of weeks, it's really gotten bad, and nobody's talked about it. Um, one thing the U.S. military has done is they've gone into what's called um, force protection mode. Force protection basically means defense only. The U.S. isn't doing patrols. They're not, well, until Operation Matador a little while ago. Um, they haven't been stepping outside of uh, their bases and doing any kind of work there. Um, so what that meant is that the Iraqis were doing the patrols. It was, you know, they sent out a platoon of Iraqis with one or two American advisors. Sounds very similar, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> but what they're doing is that we're making the Iraqis, the Iraqi military and police, targets instead of the U.S. occupation forces to reduce our own casualties. So we're making the Iraqis the targets. That's why we're seeing this huge upsurge in civilian and uh, Iraqi military casualties because we're making them the targets. If you look at most of the attacks that are happening in Iraq right now, you know, you're seeing a large amount of civilians killed. But it's kind of weird what they name a civilian. A lot of the times these civilians are lining up to join up with the Iraqi police or military. They're attacking recruiting stations. They're attacking Iraqi military outposts. And unfortunately, there's a lot of civilians being caught up in this. I'm not going to say I approve of their tactics there, but I understand why it's happening. Also, the insurgency is getting very... Um, coordinated they're learning just like any group will there's a learning curve and they're getting to this top of it um just uh about a few weeks ago there was this major attack against abu Ghraib prison read about it in the news it was kind of downplayed in the news but when you look at it from a military viewpoint it's scary um the basic facts in the news is that abu Ghraib came under attack i think it lasted from something like 10 at night till 2 in the morning um consisted of rpg fire and small arms uh, what else did they say? There were 44 American wounded, uh, about a dozen Iraqi prisoners wounded. They found one Iraqi body when they cleared the area, and the area had to be cleared by a platoon or a company of Marines from outside of the prison. A series of facts doesn't sound that bad. Now, when you step back and look at this from a military viewpoint, it's scary. This was a four-hour firefight. Think about that. They were under heavy fire for four hours. It started out with a car bomb. They, they basically, they drove a, a van into the front gates of the prison. That's how it started. Then when the Americans came out to clear the site and investigate, they set off a second explosive device to hit those who come out to investigate it. That, this was right at the beginning of the firefight. They had observed the post, so they knew all the entrances and exits, which is why they couldn't get people from inside the, inside the prison outside to clear the area. That's why they had to call Marines in from outside to sweep through. Also, this was a four-hour firefight, heavy RPG fire. They were doing what we call hunter-killer teams. It's basically one or two people with a rocket launcher, somebody carrying the extra ammo, somebody carrying the rocket launcher. They shoot a rocket, they move to another position, shoot another rocket. And they had two or three teams doing this. So basically, you had one side of the, of the base being hit by an RPG. You concentrate fire there. All of a sudden, you can be hit from another side, and they're constantly changing positions. Also, RPG rockets are not light. They're heavy, which means you had to have three supply points. Four hours of firefight is a long time. You had to resupply ammo, which means they had to have logistics with, where people knew this is how you get resupplied. You come here, or somebody runs the ammo to you, things like that. Are you see, you're starting to see how intricate all this was. And now the single scariest fact is that when the Marines did come through and sweep the area, they found one dead Iraqi. No wounded, no, no others wounded, no others dead. They found one body, which means the Iraqis are now have the logistics set up to evacuate their own casualties. That's a, very, that's a lot of work to do right there. Because one thing we learned in the military is that you're actually better off shooting to wound than shooting to kill. Because when somebody's wounded, you take three or four people out of action. Because you're talking about guys to drag them out, to repair them, to give cover fire. So they were actually doing that. They had a coordinated system to evacuate their casualties, which says a lot about their logistical process, and it also denies us intel. We have no idea who these people were. For all we know, this one insurgent casualty was just a civilian who got caught in the middle of it. We don't know. Like I said, it's a very scary situation, and... and at the same time, there were about two or three other smaller coordinated attacks that didn't receive the same kind of press that were just kind of mentioned in passing. 
So I think this is a fore, forebearer of things to come. This is the same kind of attacks we saw during Vietnam that laid a lot of casualties on the Americans. I think as the weeks progress, we're going to see more and more of these type of attacks. Well, in addition to being better coordinated in terms of the attacks, it also seems to suggest that this isn't outside fighters that are coming in and, and uh, mm -hmm. doing this. This is people that are there, and they obviously have the support of uh, civilians across the board to right. be able to carry that out. Right. Well, one thing um, that's said about a guerrilla warfare, um, you know, when you're fighting guerrilla warfare, you don't need a huge fighting force. That's part of it. You know, you can fight with a small force, but what you do need is you need the, the overwhelming support of the populace. You need them to either not talk about it and not give out information or to do minor things like hide people, hide weapons, give them food. You need that kind of support or guerrilla warfare will not succeed. And, and obviously it's getting somewhere. So people are at least tolerant of the resistance fighters because they do agree with them to some point. Um, also just talking about the, the Iraqis and this foreign fighter idea. You know, if this was being waged by foreign fighters, Abu Ghraib would be filled with foreigners, and it's not. It's filled with Iraqis. And I've talked to guys who've come back recently, and I remember one told me something very striking. You know, he said, you know, the news reports you see, or the reports from Iraq you see in the news all the time, you know, those are generally foreign fighters. The car bombs, you know, the drive-by shootings, things like that. Those are generally Iraqis, or those are generally foreign fighters. But when we're, when we're going down the road, and all of a sudden everything gets really quiet, and three ID goes off and we find ourselves in a blocked ambush. Those are the Iraqis. Because every Iraqi from probably from the age 50 down is a military veteran with combat experience. You got to realize for years they were at war with Iran, the first Gulf War, things like that. They had mandatory service. So the, the, pop, the overwhelming population of Iraqi males knows how to fight. They know how to handle weapons. They know how to handle explosives. They know small unit tactics, and they're using it against us. Got to remember, the first thing we did when we took over was disband the military. He said, hey, go home and take your weapons with you is basically what they did. And they've been biding their time, and now they're coming back. I'm curious. In the U.S. press, the U.S. military claims that it does not keep track of casualties of those people were fighting. Right. I think the quote was, we don't do body counts. Did you see any evidence that the U.S. actually does do body counts? It does do body counts because every time there is an attack in the news, there's a government source that says this many people were killed and, these, and this, this many wounded. They keep track. They do. They just haven't released the numbers. You know? and, and also, every time somebody gets involved in a firefight, when those guys come home, that lieutenant files a, files a, files a report on it. They have the numbers. They're somewhere. They're just not releasing them. And I think they're, they won't because they'll see the massive amount of civilian casualties happening. And I think just like, just like Vietnam, this is turning into a meat grinder in a lot of respects. You know, in Vietnam, it came down, down to a body count. What is the body count? And we're seeing the same thing here. Every time we get into a firefight, it's X number of, X number of Iraqis killed and, you know, Y number of Americans killed. And they always report that. So somewhere they have those numbers. All right. Unfortunately, we are uh, running out of time. What uh, final thoughts would you like to leave with listeners? Well, final thing I have to let people know is, you know, if you didn't get it from what I've been saying here, the war is not over. I hear that constantly. Um, well, I don't hear it, but that's the general sense with so many Americans that the war is over. They've had elections. They have a government. It's not over. You know, it, it's not going to be over until American forces are out of Iraq. And this is not going to happen in a year. It's not going to happen in two years. It's not going to happen until the people of the United States and the people of the world demand that the occupation ends. You know, there's too many people making too much money off of this, and they're not going to give it up unless they are forced to. Just like Vietnam, we're going to have to force them to do it. And the only way to do that is mass numbers. We need to get people out, not just once a year, not just twice a year. Every month around the world, we need these constant protests. We need bigger numbers. We need larger protests. And that's what's going to end this. That's what's going to put the pressure on the politicians to end this war. How can people find out more about your organization? Um, the best way to find out about our group is to go to www.ivaw.net. Um, that's our web page. You can read us through email on the web page. It's also, um, but we're working on a calendar and uh, current of events that our members are going to be participating in, as well as uh, we republish news stories about the organization. Mike Hoffman, thank you for spending time with us today. No problem. Thanks for having me on.